agonizer. And uh, we get the first look at this agonizer where it's like this little <laughs> triangular device. Uh, Spock... It's like a computer mouse. <laughs> uh, yes, it kind of looks like a computer mouse. Spock puts it on his shoulder. We get some really cool 60s effects. And it's like, Ugh! and it's it's obviously, it's, you know, agonizing. And so it does what it says. And so uh, but that's if, his punishment. If Spock for... is going to make that motion to somebody, like, put his hand up that close to his shoulder. You just want him to do a, a Vulcan neck pinch instead. Yeah, right. <laughs> You don't want him to zap somebody. You want him to be Vulcan. <laughs> I think it's actually interesting that he doesn't because he doesn't use it even when he's fighting later in the episode. Mm -hmm. So maybe in this universe, the Vulcans, because they're more violent, are they don't resort to the the nerve pinch because that's a non-violent. Uh, True, just subdue combat. Yeah, doesn't torture or kill or something. But yeah. It, I don't know if we could jump into this just out of order. No, <laughs> I can't yeah. imagine we'd ever do that. Uh, but like in the end, when our Spock is like, oh, they were so barbaric. They, you know, they were so barbaric you could easily fit in. But when they came here, they were too barbaric to be civilized kind of thing. So that's how he was logical enough to figure out <laughs> something had happened. And I'm like... Yeah, it would be weird if Spock had grown up in a different environment because maybe he wouldn't. He would be like the uh, the mirror Spock, you know, evil yeah. goateed Spock. Completely logical, still. Yeah, yeah but he, but still not necessarily like he was logical, but he still had uh, about his like. I was trying to think because it's almost like it was not, he didn't show emotions, but there was. It almost like it was something clouding his judgment to make him more brutal and yeah and and willing to do whatever for the good of the empire or whatever please restate command well you know since i am a t and g person it's sort of it's it's even more than wharf being like a klingon in you know, it's, it's like, it's even more than that, because that was just, they were, just weren't in the Federation, and then, but this is like, if he was a slave, and he, or his, yeah, if his race was slaves, and they were able to, he was able to overcome all that, and keep gaining power, I guess, and becoming higher and higher up in the Feder in the Empire, excuse me, um, <laughs> then yeah, yeah, that does make sense. It's like uh, it's like uh, lady bosses when people say that they're too mean, but it's because they have to be like that to get anywhere. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I definitely agree. I, I do think that this is I think even too when Spock drops a line l later on to Mr. Sulu, uh, where, where Sulu implies that he'll kill both Kirk and Spock uh, and then, you know, become the, the captain. Spock says, you know, I think you know that my agents would avenge my death, and some of them are Vulcans. Like, that's like, I mean, that's like meant to be a real threat to him. Um, and I think what you're saying, Neil, makes a lot of sense. The idea of, like, the Vulcans are these uber-violent people, um, or at least they're, they're more they're more prone to violence in here in, in this in this universe so like the fact of like oh i have agents and they're vulcan and they're gonna get you like that's like a real oh oh boy that's scary like it's a real thing that he's throwing out there to, to sulu um yeah so um uh, lieutenant kyle gets agonized and everybody's shocked and then we get our opening credits uh with the very classic uh opening about uh going where no, they say no man, we say no one, but uh, where no one has gone before. Um, and so we get a captain's log here, but uh, it's star date unknown. So we don't even know. Kirk has no clue what's going on. Um, he does kind of tell us like he doesn't, you know, we're on some kind of a uh, alternate enterprise and they don't know what's happening. Um but L Lieutenant Kyle has recovered enough to tell them that there was some odd power spike in the transporter beam just before they materialized. 
um, which will be important to know later. So thank you for the exposition. Uh, Kirk, <laughs> Kirk says McCoy should look us over in sick bay because you know it was a weird transport. Um, so then uh, they're they're walking in the corridor and uh, we see everybody's walking around with these sashes. Everybody's giving Nazi salutes. And um, on the doors we see a symbol of the of this empire. It's a it's the earth and there's a sword through it. And uh, that uh, it's pretty epic. And uh, it's a pretty good symbol if you're a empire that rules with tyranny. So uh, and it is awesome. And we'll see a variation of that later on in Deep Space Nine when we return and re revisit the mirror universe in sick bay which is to me one of the f I, I don't know this scene just made me giggle because of the way it was set up so mccoy walks in and he's like everything's all messed up here and th what there was was like these like beakers of powders just everywhere and i i said that they looked like the those colored sand things you used to make when, in the 90s do you guys remember those <laughs> that's what it looked like to me i was like you used to be able to buy, you know, containers of this. They, they used to come in bags, actually. You could buy whole kits of them, I remember, because my sister loved to do them. And they would come in all these colors, and you could take this colored sand, and you could put it in this funky-looking bottle. You could do it in lines and in patterns, and then you had this sand art. Yeah, that's what it looked like to me, which was uh, made me giggle. And then McCoy's like, the only thing that's the same here is this stain i spilled acid here a year ago and i said maybe we shouldn't keep acid on a starship i don't know like maybe that's not a good idea <laughs> that is a that is disconcerting so i one of two such mccoy's in the middle of doing some acid experiment and then it's like whoops and it's all over the place and and who knows what could have happened you know hey we do get a great I'm a doctor, not a fill in the blank in this episode. I'm so excited because that's one of my favorite bones things that he says. Um, so they're in they're in sick bay, and Kirk basically reasons the whole thing out. He's really quick. He's very smart, uh, and he's basically like, okay, we had a power surge, we had an ion storm, it made us materialize somewhere else, but everything else is the same here, um, except for this. Uh, odd empire thing that's happening. So they basically, Kirk draws to the, the conclusion that they're in a parallel universe on another dimensional plane. I don't know about you guys, but I didn't think Kirk was that smart, but apparently he is that smart. He figured it out. Within five minutes, he figured out that they were in a parallel universe on another dimensional plane. It would have probably taken, you know, this the science officer a little bit longer to figure it out but no kirk got it in about two minutes so that's good <laughs> of course he did he's kirk <laughs> so it basically the idea being that you know two storms two landing parties beaming up at the same time then you've got this power surge and it's this one in a million thing and the two groups are switched uh and that is basically um his hypothesis is at this point. They do know that the Enterprise is about to blast the Hawkins, so Kirk tells Scotty to try to short out the phaser couplings. Um, he sends Uhura to the bridge, basically to check like all the communications from Starfleet and be like, what's my mission? What are my orders? Like, what's the deal with this? Uh, with, with, with this? Um, we get kind of an... I, we get a very Kirk scene where she, where Uhura is like, she's clearly nervous to go up there by herself. She's scared. She's going, you know, alone to the bridge. She doesn't know what she's going to walk into. And, and Kirk's like, it's okay. I'll be up there soon. So it's, I know it's very Kirk and it's very like, uh, but it also does speak to, I think, when you watch like later movies of the original series cast, I think that that relationship between Kirk and all of the crew, I think it, it's definitely built on moments like these, where it's like they do look to him for that support, for that, um, for that rock to be like everything's going to be okay if the captain is here, and and I, I like this is one of those moments where like. I feel like in later movies, it pays off even more because this crew will do anything for Kirk. Mm -hmm. I mean, they'll, they'll break Federation law. They'll, they'll go back in time and get humpback whales. Like they'll do anything <laughs> for Kirk because of, 
they trust him. They they yeah. they love him as a captain. Yeah, totally. I mean, it, it, he's he's their fearless leader, and he's always he always comes through. And he may be kind of a douche sometimes, but yeah, he's he's good at what he does. Absolutely. <laughs> so, um, on the bridge, we see Sulu and Chekhov. They are preparing phasers. Um, Uhura is it comes onto the bridge, and there's a lot of male gaze happening here. Like they're just like their eyes completely are like tracking her, which is so gross. Um, it's Sulu... gross, but it's like look at uh, wh- how are those uniforms practical? Oh, they're so <laughs> not. I know. Like so, you're basically wearing this like. Your entire midriff is like exposed, which you know, if you want to wear that, anybody can wear that. That's fine. Yeah, that's but not it's the silly issue. But it's in a job. I mean, job. Exactly. Those, those those desks are probably cold. Everything's made out of metal. You lean on it like that would just be frustrating. <laughs> and you know, what if the lights give off some sort of like UV, and you've got like these little stripes of like of tan on your leg between the like super thigh high boots and the short skirts and then your your stomach because you're wearing long sleeves like I don't even I, I don't I have no idea it doesn't make a lot of sense it's really <laughs> just so that Nichelle Nichols can show off her incredible abs um, um that's you, true you know that's fine too but it's very impractical yeah um, it's so I mean little, mm-hmm. I, I mean honestly it's like I I feel better that they okay this is terrible i feel better that they want to kind of objectify her because she is a woman of color and like sometimes that wouldn't have been a good thing then but i mean she's gorgeous and then you know there's the one where uh george takei is is uh sort is a uh, fencing or whatever and he doesn't have a shirt on and stuff so it's like hey these are people who are not you know just white people these are beautiful people of other colors that are getting to show off not that they need to not that we need to ogle them or objectify them but (laughs) but it's nice to they it's nice that they were spreading it around (laughs) yes it's nice to see that not just sort of like hashtag basic white guy yeah. hashtag basic white woman put up as the standard of ultimate western beauty no there are other definitions mm-hmm. of beauty we shouldn't just be locked into one and i think what you're saying makes a lot of sense you know that, but that if episode... we were going to lock into one nichelle nichols would be a, oh, a good candidate i i 100 yes. agree yes we could <laughs> absolutely put her up and say this is the standard if you want to do that i have no problem with that um but i i I totally agree with what you're saying like to have people of color put up as a sort of a a, 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 as that sort of beauty to be admired and to be looked at rather than Mm -hmm. just a white person i think that Mm -hmm. that is i think that that's great and and they certainly do let uh, nichelle nichols play to her to her physical beauty here as well as to her um the way that she moves her body the way that she talks the way that she kind of flirts with sulu later we'll talk about all of that Mm -hmm. um so in this scene though sulu has like this crazy scar on his face um (laughs) Which is not really well done as far as... It's not done well at all. (laughs) Neil is an actor. Neil would know when it looks... You can see the line of, like, where the prosthetic starts. (laughs) Yeah. The edges are too thick. Yeah, not Not great. Not done well at all. Um, (laughs) So he's got a really terrible facial scar. He's pretty gross, and he's kind of rapey. And he basically is sleazy to Uhura and he's like still not interested I could change your mind <laughs> gross vomit uh, it was the, I don't know not that this should be an excuse but it was the 60s I, it's not an excuse but uh, and they're an evil empire I mean they're okay, evil empire. Okay, you put, you put, you put stuff like that <laughs> okay, so there we go okay they're evil that's why they did it alright um <laughs> So uh, she's clearly like, okay, w- w- stop. Um, uh, Kirk shows up, um, and Sulu goes back to his post. Uhura tells Kirk his orders are to est- 
to destroy the Halkins if they don't cooperate with the Empire. So uh, Kirk is, of course, trying to stop that from happening. Um, Scotty is attempting to 